Our, our next uh, speaker is a friend and colleague uh, here at Princeton. Uh, Sarah McClanahan is the William Todd Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs here at Princeton. She's um, also an associate of the Office of Pop Population Research, and most importantly, from my point of view, founder and director of the Bentheim Thomas Tom Tommen Center for Research on Child Well-Being here at Princeton. She's editor-in-chief of the journal The Future of Children, which is a, a journal mainly read by policymakers uh, rather than pediatricians, but it's dedicated to providing research and analysis to promote effective policies and programs for children. She's a very well-published and well-known authority on children's care, and I'll just mention uh, one of her books, uh, Growing, Up with a, Growing Up with a Single Parent, right? Right. Growing Up with a Single Parent, which uh, won a number of awards, including the Duncan Distinguished Book Award and the Good Distinguished Book Award. Uh, my friend and colleague, Sarah McClanahan, is also the principal investigator of the Fragile Family Study you heard a little bit uh, before. And today she's going to tell us about some of the findings among families and children in Newark, uh, because we think that that story is very pertinent to the story of health in New Jersey. Sarah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Uh, so Nancy mentioned a, a little bit about the Fragile Family Study, and that's what I'm going to be talking about mostly. Because I think, in a way, this study does give us a little information on, you can think of it as the beginning of the needs assessment of the children in Newark, which is obviously relevant for New Jersey more generally. So Nancy, I should also mention, was one of the people that helped us get this uh, project started. So she can answer probably <laughs> many questions as well as myself. OK. so. Um, what are fragile families? So fragile families are really unmarried parents who are trying to raise their children together. And the reason we got interested in this population was, as you can see from this chart here, there's been a very dramatic increase in children born to unmarried parents, uh, starting really in the 60s. And the increases occurred for all race ethnic groups. It's higher among African Americans, and it's higher among Hispanics, which I'm not showing in this uh, figure. But it's the, the increase has been the same for all groups. So that today, about 70% of African American children are born to unmarried parents, and about 25% uh, are of white children are born to unmarried parents. So this is a very widespread phenomenon. So when we started this study, we really had four questions in mind that motivated the study. The first was just what are the capabilities of these parents, especially the fathers. We knew quite a bit from vital stat records about the characteristics of the mothers. We knew their age and education and that kind of thing. But we knew very little about the unmarried fathers. And there was a lot of speculation about the characteristics of these men. Uh, the second question was, what is the nature of the parental relationships in these families? And here again, we had lots of speculation, but not really very good data. So on the one hand, there were people that were arguing, we shouldn't be concerned about non-marital childbearing at all. This is just like Sweden, you know, where a very high 80% of all kids are born to unmarried parents. It's not a big deal. Those relationships are very stable. Um, and in fact, the breakup rate for non-marital births in Sweden is about the same as for marital births in the US. So that was sort of one story. On the other story, on the other hand, was the story that these parents are, have no relationship, that these births are the result of the casual one-night stands, and there's really nothing to work with. So we wanted to kind of get some information from both the mothers and the fathers about what they thought their relationship was like. And then the third question was, the, how do the children do in these families? Because obviously, this is the question that we care about. If the children are doing fine, it's really not our concern as to how the parents want to organize their uh, marital status or their cohabiting status. So it's really the children that drive, drove our interest in this population. And then finally, we were interested in what role policies might play in the formation of these families as well as the child well-being in these families, because the sense was the time that welfare policies and child support policies and housing policies and together or stay cohabiting. So we were interested in these sort of four <laughs> major things. So what did we do? So we went into 20 cities. Uh, we actually. Uh, Group, we, we identified the 77 cities in the U.S. in 1996 that had populations of 200,000 or more. 
and then we sampled them um, randomly, or we sampled them with a known probability, so that we really would have a representative sample of births in cities. Uh, Newark turned out to be one of those cities. It wasn't randomly selected, but the Newark city was there because the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Fund for New Jersey wanted us to add Newark to the city, to the sample, so we did. Uh, and I think that's turned out to be very fortunate for a number of reasons. So once we were, we had our 20 cities, to actually find a pediatrician or an obstetrician in each hospital who would agree to, to uh, co-sponsor our study. Nancy found all of those people. And then we had to get IRB approval from each hospital, which was a long, arduous task. And so then we went into the hospital, and we either um, <coughs> took all the births that occurred during a certain period of time or we sampled births. In some cases, we sampled beds. So in the end, um, it's important because we do believe that we have a very representative sample of non-marital births. And when weights are added to the study, we have a sample of marital births. Uh, and you, they, you could generalize these findings to births in large US cities, or cities with populations of 200,000 or more. So we interviewed both the mothers and the fathers at the hospital. So the mothers we interviewed six or seven hours after they'd given birth, and we asked them who the father was, and then we tried to interview the fathers. Many of the fathers were interviewed at the hospital because they come in to see the baby, which the nurses all told us they would, and indeed the nurses were right, they did. And then we followed up the families on, with telephone interviews when the children were one, three, and five, and we uh, also went into the homes and did assessments of the children when they were three and five. So this all started in 1996. The births that we sampled occurred between 98 and 2000. So you can think of these as births in Newark at the turn of the century. And we're actually out in the field now uh, interviewing the families again and assessing the children. who They're now about nine years old. So we're still trying to follow them. Um, we also, the data are available on the web for any of you who happen to be interested in sort of looking at some of the data. Uh, the special features of the study is that we have a very, by oversampling non-marital births, which we did, we ended up with a very, um, a naturally occurring sample of high-risk children, because as you'll see in a minute, these, the parents who give birth outside marriage tend to be very low income. We had very high response rates, 88% uh, of the unmarried mothers participated, 75% of the unmarried fathers uh, participated. And another sort of interesting aspect of the study is, we, in addition to the telephone interviews in some of the cities, we went in and did in-depth interviews with the parents and followed them up. So we have sort of qualitative studies for a small subgroup of the parents. Uh, we also had Nancy and her colleagues added a medical records component to the study where they sent people who went back into the hospitals and were able to get information off the medical records of the, the mothers. And how many cities, or did you do that, or hospitals, or? From all kinds of cities, it's about 75% um, sample. Yeah, and that was interesting to have, because the medical record can, primarily consisted of information that was put in there by the the doctor and before the birth sometimes or right at the time of the birth. Uh, the other thing we're doing right now is we're going out in the field and collecting bio uh, data on, on the children. Okay, so to go back to these four original questions. That's what I want to talk about today. And what I'm going to show you today is just data on the city of Newark. So what we've learned about uh, the parents and the children in Newark. And I will tell you how Newark compares to the other 19 large cities in the US um, as I go along. So the first question was really, what are the parents' capabilities at birth? And this um, table gives you a sense of how the unmarried parents, uh, mothers and fathers, compare with the married parents. And uh, you can see that the married parents are older, much less likely to be a teen parent. Um, much less likely to have had a child with another partner. This turns out to be something very important in 
demographers are now calling this phenomena multi-partnered fertility. But a lot of these unmarried parents, uh, because their relationships are unstable, and I'll show you that in a minute, they, they have a child and then their relationship ends and then they repartner with a new man and they have a second child by him and then perhaps they have a third child with yet another man. So it's a, it, it means these families are very complex. So you can see even at the time of this birth that 44% of the unmarried mothers who were giving birth in Newark had another child with a different father. Uh, so that's important. If you look at the education differences, you can see that 43% of these unmarried mothers don't even have a high school degree. So these are really disadvantaged uh, population in terms of education. This is not the Swedish model in terms of, in Sweden, there's very little class uh, differences in terms of who's having the out of wedlock first. In the US, it's a very different story. Even though there are some Murphy Browns out there, these college educated professional women, having a child outside marriage, there are a tiny number of them. Most of the population that's having non-marital births uh, are lower high school education or less. Um, what's interesting in Newark is the numbers here for the married parents um, look very different. The unmarried parents for Newark look like all the other cities, but in Newark the married parents tend to be primarily immigrants. So their education level is actually much lower. So whereas in the national sample, uh, there would be only 3% of married parents who had less than a high school degree. In Newark, we actually have 31% with less than a high school degree. So in Newark, the married parents are also quite disadvantaged uh, in terms of their education. And you can see also in Newark, both populations, the married and the non-married, have a very high percent of non-white non population. And as you again, you can see there for the married, it's almost 60% are immigrants. Uh, the earnings, big earnings differences from the mothers and fathers. And this sort of continues to look at the capabilities of the parents. And someone just mentioned ago, a minute ago that uh, depression is a very common. So this is uh, the depression of the mother at the time, the year after, the first year after the child's birth. So you can see that um, it's, it's high among unmarried parents. And it's also true that the depression among mothers in Newark is higher than what we found in the other cities. So, um, and so that Newark mothers and fathers show much higher levels of depression than parents in other cities, but they aren't any different in terms of the heavy drinking or the illegal drug uh, use. Now, you may say, well, parents probably aren't reporting all of their drinking and drug use, and that's probably true. And, but they, the difference, this ought to be the same, the underreporting ought to be the same across the other cities. So in Newark, this doesn't seem to be a particularly unusual problem. Uh, the father incarceration number is striking. 41% of the unmarried fathers have been incarcerated at some time at the time of their baby, at the baby's birth. And then a few more are incarcerated after the birth. This number is uh, the same. Um, in all the cities. I mean, it's a little higher in some, a little lower in others. Newark, uh, Newark is not one of the highest. And this was a big um, surprise for us when we did the study because we knew that the incarceration rates had been going up a lot since 1980 because of changes in the penal, penal policy that put sort of lengthened the sentence and made sort of much more incarcerating for drug-related offenses. But we hadn't really thought about how that was affecting families but clearly it's affecting almost half of these unmarried parents and very different for the, married, for the married parents. So what's the nature of the relationships at birth? And the sort of phrase I use to describe this is high hopes. So I often talk about the high hopes and the low capabilities as a combination. So at the time of the birth, 44% of these unmarried parents are living together, 45%. Uh, another 34% are what we call visiting, which means they're in a romantic relationship with each other. They're just not living together. And so as you can see here, just a little over 20% of these um, couples are, have no relationship. And actually only 30%, 13% have no relationship. So this idea about these being casual one night stands is just not true. On the other hand, it isn't like Sweden, where 80% the, of the parents are living together. 
So the, the Newark is very similar to all the cities in terms of the two blue pieces of the pie, in terms of the overall percent of parents who are in romantic relationships, which is about 80% in all the cities. What's a little different in Newark is that the cohabiting is a little smaller, that slice of the pie. So in the national sample, about 51% of the parents are cohabiting. That's a little lower in Newark. And I think that's partly related to the uh, African American, because African Americans are a little bit less likely to be cohabiting, the unmarried parents, and more likely to be visiting. So there's, there's this race difference, no, di no race differences in terms of the ro overall romantic involvement, but just a le little less cohabitation. Very high levels of father involvement at birth. The father, the, we asked the mother these questions and he gave money to the child, he helped in other ways, uh, visited mothers in the hospital, the child's going to have the father's surname and you can read the other pieces. The two numbers with uh, asterisks beside them are the ones in which Newark is a little lower. So in Newark there's a little bit less visiting in the hospital among the fathers and a little bit less likely to take the father's, uh, that the child's going to have the father's surname. But, in, but the, they're pretty s small differences. So in general you could say the parents are, a lot of them are romantically involved, the fathers are involved. Uh, the parents, if you ask them whether marriage is better for kids, is marriage the ideal situation, they're very high on that. Uh, married couples answer a little bit higher, obviously, than unmarried parents, but all the unmarried parents are over 50% of them think that marriage is the ideal thing for the kids. Uh, they also rank their chances of marriage as very high. Uh, interestingly, you can see here the fathers are a little bit more positive than the mothers. And that's because, remember, we didn't get all the fathers. We only got 75% of the fathers. And it became very clear to us that the 75% that we got in the study were, uh, were the ones that were hoping to hang on to the mother. And in fact, if you just take the fathers and mothers where we have both the couple re reports, you still see some of this gender gap. So the, the, the mothers are a little more skeptical about whether this is going to work out. Uh, another area that's kind of the flip side of what I've been saying so far is that even though these parents are very positive about marriage and they have hopes for marriage, uh, they have very, most of them think a single mother can raise a child alone, especially the mothers. Uh, and that's not a huge difference among the fathers between the married and the unmarried fathers. So, so, so yes, high hopes and they have the ideal, but on the other hand, they certainly feel that a single mother can do the job alone. So the third question was sort of what happens to these relationships over time? And here the bottom line is really uh, instability and growing complexity. So at five years, if you look at what's happened, you can sort of the first uh, set of bars really shows you how many of these uh, parents are still together. Uh, at the, at the, by the time the child's five. And you can see that a little over 60% of the married parents are still together. That's not a really high number. And the number's somewhat less than 50% for the cohabitors, and then it goes down and down. Uh, interestingly, that last group of parents, 10% of those who said they were friends or no contact, are now in a, some kind of romantic relationship with each other. Um, and I think you know a couple of them have actually married. Um, beginning, a lot of them have begun a new relationship and a lot of them have had a child with a new partner. So this sort of shows you the other side of what I was mentioning before. Remember at the time of birth, about 44% of the mother already had a child with a, with a former partner. And as you can see, the, the, the mothers who are only romantically involved or no contact with the father, they've formed relationships and they've had another child with a new man. So this again is this multi-partnered fertility. And I think this is important because I think the instability of these families and the complexity of the families. I mean, if you can think about, um, if a, we've known for quite a while that when a couple gets divorced and they try to get child support from the non-resident father and arrange visiting hours with the Ron Richard resident father, that's complicated. Well, so you can imagine what that must be if you have three children you're trying to arrange visitation for three different fathers. You're trying to collect child support from three different men. And there is a lot of um, jealousy that comes up. Uh, it, it was interesting. We found that the, the conflict that comes is not about 
is not in the household of the mother that's not getting the child's support. The, con the, con the conflict comes when the guy she's now living with goes and visits a child by a former partner. And this is called the baby mama drama. And, it, you know, and, it's, and so just think about the jealousies that occurred. This, he's had a child over here. He's had a obviously a relationship with this woman. Now he goes over to see the child, and this is sort of upsetting to the mama. So the bottom line of all this is just to give you a sense of how complex and all of the kind of changing of partnerships. So this is sort of what, as in, in addition to the poverty and the uh, low education that these families. So the last question, which uh, I wanted to talk about a little bit because I know this is what you're interested in, is sort of what does this all mean for the child health outcomes? Um, so you can see uh, the first row will really show you what percent of the children in this population by age five have been diagnosed with, with asthma. And you can see it's a little higher among the unmarried parents, uh, not hugely different. I would say that this number is about 50% higher than the other cities. So Newark is, you know, scores higher, which is not a good thing, uh, on the asthma. On the obesity, um, also a little difference across the marital status groups, but the big difference here is the obesity is twice as high in Newark as in these other cities. And these other cities uh, may not be, um, oh, I should mention, in these outcomes I've looked at, I have taken it, I have adjusted for differences in race, ethnicity, immigrant status, uh, income of the parents, and education, and age of the mother. So these differences are not, you can't say this is just due to that Newark has a poorer population. So that's all been sort of removed. So these are the, the, uh, the differences sort of taking, controlling for those other differences. So Newark is doing worse on asthma. It's doing a lot worse on obesity. And on the next group is just this overall question that's asking a lot of big national surveys about how's your child's health. Turns out it does seem to be uh, predictive of a lot of things. And if you look at the last group, the, the fair or poor, you can see only about 5% of the mothers are reporting their child's health as fair or poor. But this is also about four times the national average. So this number doesn't look too high, but in the other uh, cities, it, it's about one to one and a half uh, percent are saying that. On the uh, hospital, uh, hospitalization rates overnight, this is also much higher in Newark. Um, it's about four times higher, sort of just like the fair, poor health. Um, so there's not a lot of it, but Newark really stands out in terms of uh, what we find. Uh, the accidents and the injuries requiring medical attention in the last year is no different in Newark. In fact, if anything, it might be 10% lower in Newark. So lots of hospitalizations um, overnight, but not lots more of this accident injury. Then the last slide I want to show you is just some of the information on the health inputs. So if you look at the third row here down about the insurance, it looks like about 10% of children at age five now. This is all about at age five, and this is adjusting for all these differences. Uh, don't have any health insurance, and that's about 10% higher than the children in the other national cities. So it's not a lot higher. It seems like it's a lot lower than what Nancy was reporting, isn't it? Do you, this seems like. 13% Oh, okay, okay. So this isn't so low. So, you know, most kids are covered by insurance, but um, it is a little worse in Newark than in the other cities. Uh, the child, having at least one child well baby visit in the last year, these numbers are extremely high in Newark, and they're, the, they're also high. They're, they're the same as they are in other cities. And then finally, the child having a regular source of care, this number is pretty much the same. It's about 5% lower in Newark than in other cities, but again, at a very high base. So that's, um, these are all our funders. I want to thank them. So I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>
cities in New Jersey? I don't know, because I think these, these numbers look pretty good in terms of the access and the utilization of having the regular sort of care. I think all of our cities have, have major medical centers, because they're all over 200,000 people. So we've got Detroit and Baltimore and New York City and Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. I think they all have. Well, take a city like Trenton. Yeah, we they wouldn't have a city like Trenton because it's too small. See, all our cities are 200,000 or more. Yeah, it could be a very different story in, in Trenton. Uh, yeah. I have a question about the uh, uh, public assistance. Yes. Somewhere between 60 and 67 percent you had for those women who are not married. Mm -hmm. um, it's my understanding that women on public assistance, if they either are married or there's a man in the house, they get less or there's, there's, that's factored in. Yeah. Yeah. How did this um, apply to your data, which is all self-reported? So I'm not quite sure what question. Are you asking me, do I think the mothers aren't? In other words, accurate because they don't want to indicate that they have a partner living there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we're, we've been following it for five years, and uh, you know, I think again, if there was some problem with that, that would that would be the problem in all the cities. And so I so what I'm really so maybe the base number I've given you is a little wrong, but the fact about Newark being sort of different than the others, or, or the relative status, I don't think it would affect that. The other thing is on these, we did go to 75 of these couples and follow them with these qualitative in-depth interviews over time. So we really um, talked to both the parents. And um, so I think that, I'm, I'm pretty sure that number is accurate. I mean, if anything, you would think the mother wouldn't tell us about the man at all, right? That wouldn't, she wouldn't report that, you know, she wouldn't give us the information so we could go interview him because it would then turn up that he was living at the house she lived in. Thank, thank you for the information. I can imagine the monumental hurdles you had in getting all the approvals. Uh, what? 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 What I'm interested in is the incidence of prematurity in the different populations. Do you have that information? Nancy, can you answer that? I know you're to year five for these children, but Frank Furstenberg's old work about what some of these mothers do, you know, um, mm -hmm. continue their education, and you sort of, are you gonna be able to look at that in a dynamic way over yeah, time? Yeah. That's a very interesting question, and in fact, a couple of weeks, we have a lot of students doing dissertations and writing papers with the data, and a student presented a paper um, a couple of weeks ago where she shows that a large number of these mothers go back to school, and no one's hardly looked at that. And someone was, someone remembered Frank Furstenberg's team. And it turns out, of course, the mother, the women who are not married or who are not cohabiting are more likely to go back to school. So about 30% of these mothers get more education within a five year period. Um, so the teen mothers are more likely to finish high school, but we look at vocational school and even college. And there's a lot of going back to school among these women, much more than, people always think, well, education at birth, that kind of measures where you are. You know, that's a, you don't have to worry about that variable changing. But that's clearly not the case with this population. Yeah? Hi, my name is Ian Rossman. I'm a fourth year med student at Robert Wood. Yeah. And my question was, have you looked at attitudes about family planning and contraception in these groups? Yes. Future pregnancies. Yeah, we didn't ask them about, um, sorry, that's, that's my husband. I'm, 
I'm supposed to be going in a cab to the Philadelphia airport to try to help my son who's in Austin, Texas. <laughs> and I have to get there, my plane leaves it too, so I, I gotta go. Maybe Nancy, you can help answer some of the questions. Sure. <laughs> I hate to do this, I'm sorry. And it was my... <laughs>